to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Bible says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. We welcome you today to our study of the Word of God. In today's lessons, we're thinking about Bible questions and answers, and we're continuing with our Bible question and answer series. And as always, if you've got a question you'd like to submit for this series, you can send those questions to us by email, questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can visit our website thegospelofchrist.com slash questions and submit those and we will answer them on the word on the air by the word of God. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ in your area. We want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your area. They'd love to sit down and study the Word of God with you and they'd love for you to visit their assembly at any time. We now begin with our first question that has been submitted by one of our viewers and the question is asked like this. Dear sirs, do you believe that God heals people today? Indeed, what a good question that is and it's one that all of us have thought about from time to time for the reason being we all suffer and have sickness from time to time. There isn't a person alive who doesn't face some type of suffering, some type of sickness, some type of disease or illness, and we're looking for help, help beyond maybe even what the medical field can give us. We long for and we desire the divine help of God. And so does the Bible teach that God heals people today? Well, friend, He absolutely does. And the Scripture affirms that God does that through the power of prayer today. I want to direct your attention to James chapter 5, verse 13 following. The Bible says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. And so from this verse, we hear God say, Is anybody suffering? What's the answer to that? Pray. Is anybody cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. And the prayer of faith, there's the idea, the prayer of faith will save him. And so does God still heal people today? He absolutely does through the power of prayer. We have the privilege to approach the throne of God, the throne of grace, and find help. Hebrews 4.16 says it this, this way, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. And so in the New Testament, we definitely know that God still heals people today. In fact, you find that principle even under the Old Testament. Here's a, a beautiful passage that illustrates God's power to heal from the Old Testament. I want you to listen to 2 Kings chapter 20, and I want you to hear what God says to King Hezekiah in verse number 5. God said to his prophet, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father. Now listen to this. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. Hezekiah became sick and so in his sickness and distress, he turned to God in prayer and made his request known to God. And God said, I've heard your prayer. I've seen your tears. I will heal you. 
Friend, the simple fact is that God does still heal, heal people today, but maybe even more of an important question we might want to ask is, how is God healing people today? Is God healing people today, maybe the way Jesus or the apostles did in the first century? For example, is somebody going to go around today by the power of miracles and heal someone who's got a withered arm? Is somebody going to go to the cemetery and raise somebody who's dead like Jesus did Lazarus? Are we living in the age where men and women can miraculously do that today? Well, no, that's not the way God's healing. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 8 through 10 teaches that the age of the miraculous, the ability to understand that miracle or the miraculous, the ability to pass that gift on has come to an end, but God still heals through the power of prayer. If I want to receive God's healing, and if it's according to God's will, then friend, I pray to God. I ask for God's help. And the Bible says, if anyone's suffering, he can pray. He can call for the elders of the church, and they'll pray over him. And it is the prayer of faith that will save that individual. So to answer the question, yes, God still heals today. He does that through the power of and the avenue of prayer, which is a wonderful Christian privilege. We now move to our second question that's been submitted, and the question goes like this. A viewer asks, how do I get God's guidance today, and where do I go in life from here? Basically, the individual is asking, how do I get God's direction? Where can I go to, to learn what God wants me to do in this life? And in my life right now, where do I go from here? How do I live a life that's pleasing to God? Friend, what a great question that indeed is. Where do we get God's guidance today? Well, friend, God's guidance is found in His Word. God gives us direction through His Word. The Bible says in Jeremiah 10, verse 23, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And so how do I get God's guidance? Not in men, not in men's ideas and ways. Isaiah 55, verses 7 through 11, God says, My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. God's guidance is found in His Word. The Bible is the inspired Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, Verses 16 and 17, the Bible, God's Word, God's breathed out Word, has everything we need for life and godliness. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, it is all truth, John 17, 17. And if I will live by it and follow it, friend, I will assure you, if you want God's guidance, turn no further than the Word of God. But let's be careful in this area because sometimes people want to turn to men for God's guidance. They want other people to, as it were, tell them what to do and maybe study for them and tell them what God wants them to do. Friend, I need to be sure to study the Bible for myself. 2 Timothy 2.15 and Acts 17 verse 11. We need to search the scriptures daily and we need to realize God's ways may be different than what someone else is telling you. They may not be telling you what God says if you don't check it for yourself. Do you remember Proverbs uh, chapter 16 and Proverbs 14? The Bible tells us there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Let's realize we want to put God's ways first, and when we think about where do we go from here, when I start studying my Bible, Friend, I want to know what God wants me to do. I want to start with the attitude of, Lord, what would you have me to do? Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, Saul asked that great question. And from the point I start studying, where I am right there, when I start studying, I want to go forward. I want to go forward in learning God's will. I want to take steps forward in following the example of Christ. 1 Peter 2, verse 21, I want to, to move onward in having the mind of Christ, Philippians 2 verse 5, and transforming my life into the image of Almighty God, Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. And so a great question being asked, God's guidance is found in His divine Word which has everything we need to make us complete, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17. When a person commits himself 
to studying the Bible. Friend, we want to go forward, press toward the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, verses 12 through 16. We now direct our attention to a third question that has been submitted by one of our viewers. And the question is asked like unto this. The Roman Catholic Church is trying to stop cremation for funerals. They only want to do full burials. They claim this way the full body and soul reach the Heavenly Father complete. What does the church, and in essence, what does the Bible teach on this subject? A friend, as we think about the subject of cremation versus burial, we need to first put our focus on what man needs to be worried about as it pertains to his nature. Jesus said in Matthew 10 verse 28, and he taught us where the real emphasis should be. Matthew 10 verse 28, Jesus said, Do not fear him who can destroy body only, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell fire. I'm not afraid of what somebody might do to my body, how somebody might persecute us or hurt the body. Uh, we're not worried about those kind of things in this life as our emphasis. The emphasis for the Christian is upon fearing Him who can destroy both body and soul in hell fire. And so the real emphasis needs to be upon God. What does God want us to do? Not what can men do to the body, but what does God want us to do in this life? And how does God want us to live in such a way that will please Him? And friend, there are some passages in the Bible which clearly teach that burial is an accepted way. Jesus Himself was buried in the tomb, we learn. Lazarus was buried in John chapter 11. But we also need to realize that during the Hebrew time, there were some passages that taught that cremation was a standard was being used during the time of the Israelites. For example, listen to Amos chapter 6 and verse number 10 where we learn that this was a common practice during the time of the Israelites to, at least on some occasions, uh, cremate certain people. Amos chapter 6 verse number 10, the Bible records these words for us. And when a relative of the dead with one who will burn the bodies, picks up the bodies to take them out of the house, he will say to one inside the house, Are there any more with you? Then someone will say, None. And he will say, Hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. And so here you've got an example under the Old Testament where God's people were as a practice, at least for some people in that day, were using cremation. And so cremation was something they used then as well as burial. You'll find other examples. Saul and his son, uh, God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac on the fire, although he did not go through with that. The process naturally would have burned his body. We find other examples as well where certain men's bones are, are burned. And there are times where that is done as a curse. And there are times when it's not done that way. And so sometimes it's done for uh, the preventing of disease. Sometimes it's done for custom's sake under the Old Testament. And then forget not the words of 1 Corinthians 13. I want you to listen to what verse number 3 says to the Christian. He asked this question. Paul, is he speaking about love and sacrifice and, and making sure that the motive is really what it ought to be? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the, feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Friend, is Paul talking about a practice here which would have been contrary to the will of God? I understand he's talking about persecution. I understand that some may do that to dishonor them, but would that cost Paul or any other Christian their soul? If cremation is wrong, then we have to consider these things. And so what does the Scripture teach on this subject? Friend, we have examples in the Bible of burial. We have the examples in the Bible of cremation. The Bible doesn't condemn any of those types of practices, and so either would be approved or acceptable for the child of God. There's no scripture preventing either one of those from being contrary to the will of God. Passages that people often 
site to prove cremation is wrong. We're under the Old Testament where people were using that sometimes with idolatry, sometimes to maybe put a curse on other people, but God never places that in the Bible on other people. And so the Bible doesn't say either way as to one of those being better than the other, one being wrong and the other being right. A Christian could participate in either one of those and not live and be in accord, not live contrary to the will of God. Now, are there personal preferences? Well, sure there are. As the reader or as our viewer notes, uh, his personal preference would be burial. That would be my personal preference as well. But friend, we're talking about personal preference. We're not talking about what does the Word of God say. God does not condemn either practice per se, and thus a Christian could not come down hard and fast and say someone who is cremated is going to hell. Wait a minute now. The Bible is going to turn to dust either way. It's the emphasis in Scripture is not what happens to the body after this life. The emphasis in Scripture is, was my soul prepared to meet my God? That's Matthew 10, 28. Don't fear him who can destroy body. That, that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is not on the body and what happens to it. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hellfire. And so many people do opt for cremation today. Uh, a, a common burial cost today would be somewhere between eight and $12,000. You can look at the numbers today and a common creation cost is about a third of that, two to $3,000. You can see why some people might opt for that. And again, the Bible doesn't condemn either one of these practices as being sinful. And so this is an optional matter that a Christian may choose upon himself and the Word of God does not condemn as wrong or right uh, as wrong because God does not say that is the case. All right, we now move to another question concerning these items of our Bible questions and answers. But before we do, I want to remind you that if you've got a question you'd like to submit, you can do that by email. You can email us at questions at thegospelofchrist.com or you can go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com slash questions. You can fill out a form and those will be sent to us and we'll be happy to look to the Word of God to give a thus saith the Lord on these matters. Now to our next question. One of our viewers writes, Concerning 2 Corinthians 6, verse number 17, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, uh, the individual says, please explain these verses. And here's the background of that question. I have heard one say to not go around people who are not or have not obeyed the gospel. If I go somewhere to a family member's house or something like that, and they are drinking or doing something wrong, I would no doubt leave. But just to visit somebody who's not a Christian, is that wrong? Well, in both contexts, in understanding these scriptures, uh, context would be king. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the context begins in verse number 14, where we are told to have no fellowship with immoral practices and that which is contrary to the will of God. We're not to have fellowship with Baal, the false gods. We're not to have fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, Ephesians 5.11. I am not to be in a joint common participation with. I'm not to be in a joint venture have in common with uh, these types of immoral practices. And then of course 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22, abstain from every appearance of evil. And so when God says, come out from among them and be separate, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, He's talking about people no longer living a joint common practice like that. People leaving that lifestyle. I'm no longer going to be attached to people who live immorally, to false gods, to idolatry. I'm not going to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers is the context of 2 Corinthians 6 verses 14 through 17. When I obey the gospel, I leave that lifestyle and those relationships and those immoral practices behind. Now, does that then mean that I can never be around Someone who is not a Christian? Well, friend, if that's the case, how would you ever teach them the gospel? If that's the case, how would you go anywhere in the world? How would you go grocery shopping? How would you walk down the street? There's going to be people of the world everywhere. What we find in the Bible is this type of ideology. Christians are not to be of the world. We're in the world 
but we're not of the world. And that's the idea of 2 Corinthians 6, 17. If I go over to someone's house or a friend's house or a family member's house who is not a member of the Lord's church and, and we're visiting, I can take opportunities to encourage them. I can let my light shine as a Christian and there's nothing immoral or ungodly going on. Have I committed some sin by doing that? Well, of course not. Jesus, where did He go? He went to the sinners. He went to the tax collectors. He spoke at the well with the woman who was in sin. He, he often would go to those who needed Him the most. Was it sinful for Jesus to do that? Well, of course not. Now, if then practices begin to occur that are immoral and that can affect my reputation, that can tempt me to sin, well, no doubt I'd want to depart from that. If someone begins to do drugs, or somebody begins to uh, be involved in alcohol, or somebody begins to be involved in some immoral practices, or something being shown on the TV that's ungodly, I want to depart from that. I want to remove myself from that temptation. I don't want to be in fellowship with that. But to say that you can't even visit with people who are not Christians, that's not the context of 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. Same would be true with 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 uh, although we are to abstain from every appearance of evil that would include impacting my influence I, I don't I'm not going to be seen going into a place where immorality is rampant uh, I'm going to remove myself from that so it doesn't affect my reputation and influence but to go over to a friend's house or a family member's house, or to you know, be in Walmart where it's full of people who are not members, maybe of the Lord's church, maybe even immoral people. Is that necessarily sinful? Well, that's not the idea again. Jesus taught that Christians are to be in the world, but not attached to the world. Not to be in, have those things in common with the world is the idea. And so we must be very careful that we walk the way God wants us to walk. Walk in the light. Follow the example of Jesus and remember, I have to live in this world if I'm going to teach others the gospel. How will I ever evangelize if I'm never around people who are lost in sin? Well, it would be impossible to. I've got to go places where they are, I'm not participating in what they may do, but I've got to go down maybe to where people are dealing with problems, maybe where people are involved in things that are immoral. Uh, not, again, not to associate with that, but with the clear intent of teaching the gospel. If that begins to be something they don't care to hear or listen to, well, I'm going to depart from that because I don't want to be in fellowship with immorality and ungodliness. And so I hope that answers the question as we think about our fellowship and our participation with those who maybe are not members of the church. And hopefully all of that is done with an eye toward and with the mindset of teaching them the gospel, and being a faithful child of God. Another viewer has submitted this question, such a good question for us to conclude our lesson on today. And the question is asked this way. Please explain why Christians no longer have to adhere to the law of Moses. There is a growing movement today that claims both faith in Christ and binding of the law of Moses. And so we think about today, can a person have faith in Christ, be a Christian, and then demand that we also keep the law of Moses? Now let's direct our attention to several scriptures which teach that we cannot bind the law of Moses today, nor would we want to. Hebrews chapter 10 I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 9. Speaking of Christ and His willingness to come as a sacrifice, the Bible says, Then He said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Now don't miss this. He, that is Christ, takes away the first, that He may establish the second. What, what is Christ taking away and what is Christ establishing? Well, He's taking away the first covenant. Hebrews 10 verses 3 and 4, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. Ephesians 2 verses 14 and 15 and Colossians 2 verses 14 and 15, Jesus nailed the commandments, the old law, to the cross. He tore it down, breaking down that middle wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. And so Christ, in His death, in His sacrifice, He took away the first. It is no more. If it's taken away, it's no longer 
man's ob obligation to follow that, that he may establish the second, the second covenant, the law and the covenant of Christ. Now, here's something interesting to consider. James 2 verse 10 says this, He who keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one part, James says you've stumbled in all of it. What's James correlating there? That the whole law must be kept. You can't take bits and pieces and parts and say, well, I like this in the old law, but we don't need this anymore. I like this, but we don't need that anymore. Friend, here's the idea. If Christ is our sacrifice today, Hebrews 10 verse 12 says he clearly is. This man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Then if I'm going to say that's true, then what about all those Old Testament sacrifices? If I don't keep those, that I'm stumbling in all of the law. What about building a booth in the month of October and living in those booths? What about the Feast of Tabernacles? What about uh, Passover and all those various ideas? Burning of incense. What about, here's one that we just can't keep today. What about the priestly order of Aaron? During the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, all those genealogical records were lost. How can anybody be an Aaronic priest today, a Le Levitical priest today, if all that's been lost? We say, well, we've got Christ, exactly the point. If Christ is the new priest, if He brought in the new law, if He is the sacrifice, then friend, it's impossible for me to keep the old law. And the old law itself says, if you stumble in one point, you've stumbled in it all. And so if I'm going to say old law, then friend, it's all or nothing. And we can't keep it all today. Even Peter said that. Acts chapter 15, verses 7 through 10, Peter said, Neither we nor our fathers could keep it perfectly. Now listen to the words of Hebrews 8, verse 13. In that God says a new covenant, He's made the first obsolete. What is becoming obsolete and growing old, Paul said, or the Hebrew writer said, is ready to vanish away. The old law, according to the New Testament, is obsolete, like a horse and buggy transportation, like a rotary phone, like washing clothes on a washboard. The old law is obsolete. It's no good. It's not for Christians to follow, and we're not commanded to keep that. And so should we keep the old law today? That's not the law I'm going to be judged by. I'm going to be judged by the words of Christ. And friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, more than anything, we encourage you to submit to the teaching of Christ. Have you heard the message about Jesus? Do you believe He's the Son of God? Would you be willing to repent and change your ways and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? Acts 2 verse 38. If you've never done that today, we're encouraging you to obey the gospel before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.